I'm sorry that this episode is a week late, but I've had a sore throat that's just felt endless. Good thing I brewed myself some infinity. Where does this function cross the y-axis? How many integers are there? How many decimal places does the quantity 1 divided by 3 have? Well, the answer is there's no number large enough to answer these questions. No matter what string of digits you come up with, no matter how many exponents or factorials or up arrows you throw at expressing such a number, you're not going to get anywhere close to one that will do it. This is the concept of infinity. It's not a number. It's a concept expressing the throwing up of one's hands and saying numbers just aren't sufficient to describe this quantity. It took us a long while to harness infinity for anything useful, mathematically or otherwise. Aristotle was okay with the idea of bounded infinities, like the number of fractions between 0 and 1, but thought it pointless to imagine a boundless quantity like the number of natural numbers. Because Aristotle set the tenor for much of the world's academia up until a couple hundred years ago, most academics followed his lead and generally kept infinity at arm's length until the invention of calculus. Mathematicians just haven't been able to shut up about infinities of various types since then. The tools they've developed that rely on those concepts, including calculus, have been extremely useful for the sciences, allowing researchers and theorists to analyze the universe in many ways that wouldn't be possible otherwise. But interestingly, although scientists are happy to use infinity as a mathematical sprocket in the engine of their search for answers, they generally refuse to accept it as a solution to any equation. Getting an answer of infinity isn't interpreted as meaning that the quantity being calculated is actually limitless, but rather as a signal that the mathematical model has failed to give a meaningful description of some scenario. For example, the Einstein equations for relativity are remarkably accurate when describing the effects of gravity on objects like planets and stars, but when you plug a gravitational singularity like a black hole into them, it returns an answer of infinity for several quantities. Physicists don't believe that these quantities are literally infinite inside the event horizon of a black hole. They simply accept that black holes are an edge case of the rules that govern our universe and that relativity just isn't sufficient to fully understand what's going on in there. This reluctance to accept infinity as an answer isn't just an ideological thing. It's a practical necessity of using mathematics to understand nature. Allowing an infinite something or other dissolves any advantage that we gain by using equations. How does kinetic energy vary with the speed of an infinitely massive object? It doesn't. It always has the same kinetic energy whether it's going a thousand meters a second or a million. How much time does it take the population of predators in an area to double if they have access to an infinite density of prey, the same time it takes them to quadruple or quintuple? All the nuance and predictive power of equations like these evaporates when one of their variables is allowed to be infinitely large. The problems with infinity also extend to domains outside the natural sciences. Philosopher Nick Bostrom's 2011 paper, Infinite Ethics, points out that in utilitarian systems of morality, where right and wrong are determined by what results in the greatest net increase of pleasure and net decrease of suffering. Any act in a universe with an infinite number of beings is totally amoral. Even if you pull a Thanos and murder half the inhabitants of an infinite cosmos, infinity divided by two is still infinity, so your action has caused no net increase or decrease in either happiness or suffering, and thus has no moral value either way. In economics, infinity plays a role in a state termed perfectly inelastic demand. There's usually a presumed give-and-take relationship between supply and demand, where overall increases in price result in decreased demand for a good or service. However, in some cases, the price has no effect whatsoever on the demand. If producers charge $5, $50, or $500 for whatever they're selling, they'll sell the same amount of it regardless because until the consumer is satisfied, their marginal utility and the slope of the demand curve is infinite. The classic example of perfectly inelastic demand is insulin for people with diabetes. Without insulin, those people will die, so they will purchase 70 units of insulin per day regardless of how much it costs. Less extreme healthcare demands don't fare much better. The average elasticity of all healthcare, with the exception of preventative services and pharmacy purchases, is around negative 0.17 meaning that if the price of any particular medical service doubled, we'd probably only see a 17% reduction in demand for it. Compare that to the elasticity of something like gasoline, 0.35, or restaurant meals, 2.27.
As with the sciences, the arguably infinite subjective value of life-saving medical care throws the standard economic models for a bit of a loop. If such care is taxed at 5% of the overall cost, what ratio of the tax will be borne by the patient? The same amount as if it were taxed at 10 or 15%, that is to say, all of it. How much business will you lose if you raise the price of your medicine by $10? The same as if you raise it $10,000. None whatsoever. Minus the people who kick the bucket because they can't pay. Without some sort of external regulating factor to force an upper bound on those variables, crazy stuff can happen. The concept of infinity has been remarkably useful in the service of discovering new facts about the universe and solving interesting problems. There's also something abstractly charming about harnessing the limitless in a single lemon skate and making it do your bidding as a means of eventually getting at answers that are quantitatively coherent. But when dallying with such equations, it's important to remember how weird infinity really is and take steps to tame it when necessary. While it's a little bit less than infinity, five years of thunk is still an impressive number. For anyone who's just now joining what PBS Spacetime has dubbed one of the most underviewed shows on YouTube. Thanks for that ego boost, Matt. Welcome. Feel free to watch some more, there's plenty. But for anyone who's stuck with me, I assure you, I've read every comment and I've been absolutely floored by both the generosity of Patreon supporters and commenters who took the time to inform me that I've opened up some new horizon for them. Also, if you haven't noticed her name at the end of every single episode, an extra special thanks to my fiancé and perpetual editor, Liz, who has forced me to throw out dozens of awful scripts and has put up with my silly, whining complaints every time. Liz, I earnestly couldn't do this without you. Or your nachos. Maybe this is the year that we break 20,000 subscribers. If that happens, let's do a live stream or something. I'd love to chat with some of you brilliant folks. Regardless, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah subscribe blah share. And don't stop dunking.